My name is Neil Butcher, I'm part of the Brixham Battery Heritage Group, I'm the chairman. We are a heritage group within Brixham Torbay. The history here goes back to 1500s and we depict the 1940 to, 40 to 45 era. It's a properly fully, fully fledged battery. You've got the two gun sites, two gun areas, which with rest rooms adjoining, with underground ammunition tunnels that link to the rest, rest rooms. The BOP up by the double gates, that was where the commanding officer would have fired, would have, would have controlled everything. He would have fired the guns from there if need be, but the guns, if that, was, if that took a hit, then the guns could fire independently. The actual crew here exists, uh, comprised of 40% um, home Guard. The Home Guard were initially what they say a home front soldier outfit that was first put into action in 1940 on the, the defence of England after Dunkirk um, because of Operation Sea Lion which was the proposed invasion by Germany on England. The Home Guard were founded to stop them coming over basically. Well they were, they were people that were, were too, too young to be called up or they were people that um, were uh, reserved, reserved occupation, like we, and they would have been in the Home Guard, or people that were too old, or, and retired people. So you'd have had three, I would have thought, three, three groups of people. The battery, well it was here, it was an anti-invasion battery, built in 1940, but in case of the invasion by the Germans, uh, it was built, as I understand it, in about three months time. It took three months to build. There was 120 of these all around the coast, from Scotland round to Bristol. And this battery here at Brixham is one of seven that remain. And, in a, and we consider it that one of the best that's left because we've got all the buildings, albeit some of them a little bit derelict. All we haven't got are the home guard that manned it. I'm Belinda, my name's Belinda and I'm here because my husband Gordon is very interested in the battery. I'm interested in uh, the nostalgia and the fashions and just listening because I find everything very um, fascinating as to how they coped and everything. So, And I thought I would become a Land Army girl because it's uh, women's rights and all that, stand up for the women. So that's why I'm here. This is the Women's Land what, Army display, um, yep. What can you tell us about that? Well, somewhere we've got... That's, that's how much we would have been paid weekly, and half of that money would have gone to um, the places that we would be staying in it, at, you know, for board and lodgings. And, lodgings. and um, ration book, which everybody had. And gas masks, which... We had to carry with us all the time, all the time didn't we? always, yep. And these yeah. are the tools which we use to yeah. work the land. Yeah. Sometimes we could have worked 12 hours a day, yeah. gone home and then got up at 5 o'clock to start all over again yeah. the next day. All weathers. And all that's weathers. the sort of things that we would have been uh, growing and um, picking and taking. Yeah. Then you've got a water tank, you've got two, in two generator rooms, one for the site and one for the, the, the working of the, of the guns. You had a, um, a guard room, you had a cookhouse, you had uh, ammunition pits and mortar pits and light, ammunition, light machine gun pits as well. The guns here were never fired in anger. We only, we only, we only had two 4.7 Japanese cruiser guns to protect the coastline and they were ineffective because of the, because of the actual zigzag of the coastline. The MTB boats did more protecting than the guns did. They were, they were all interlinked. In fact, at one time there was over 160 interlinked batteries, um, basically taken up from, again like this one, taken right, going right back to the Armada and so on and so forth. Um, and it was all, it was all interlinked to, to, to support a, an invasion area on this coast.
My name's Gordon Ward, I'm a member of the Bricks and Battery Heritage Group and uh, I bring along a Jeep every week In uh, it's marked up in the 12th Devonshire Regiment and uh, my mother's brother Fred was uh, in the 12th Devonshires which was an airborne troop and uh, he was unfortunately killed while on manoeuvres in Holland just before the end of the Second World War in uh, February 45. He was really, really unlucky because uh, he was killed on the 17th and it turns out that the patrols for his group were due to end on the 17th and unfortunately himself and two other members of his troop were both killed on that day. If they'd managed to last one more day that would have been the end of the Second World War for them. But uh, So I dress in the 12th Airborne uniform just as a tribute to Fred. Okay, uh, uh, my name's Lewis Brosker and uh, uh, we represent uh, a group of American combat engineers. Um, so I'm wearing my A-class uh, this weekend uh, in celebration of VJ Day. Um, so yeah, we, uh, as combat engineers, a lot of what we do is we talk about uh, explosives, uh, mine laying and mine clearing, um, and just some of the tools that the engineers would have used when they got off the boats at D-Day. Uh, so this is um, probably the, uh, the most iconic vehicle that the Americans produced during the Second World War. Uh, this is uh, a Ford GPW, uh, more commonly known as a Willys Jeep. So it was possibly, well, probably one of the first real 4x4 vehicles. Uh, it was designed to be light, it was designed to um, carry four troops and their equipment. Uh, you could tow um, up to about a thousand pounds in weight. Uh, the engine was designed to be um, fairly uh, low profile, uh, so it's a 2.2 litre four cylinder side valve engine which means the valves are off to the side rather than up above, which means that the overall height of the engine is much lower. So when you fold the windscreen down, it's a much lower profile vehicle. So, we're Second, Second Devon's Global 2 Living History Association and today we're representing the first Devons who were fought out in Burma. That, that would have been from... They were, uh, 43 to 45. Well, what we're wearing is what we've known as um, Jungle Green. It's a lightweight version of the standard uniform. So it's a two-piece uniform, it's a shirt and trousers. Basically a normal kit. I'm wearing the Mark II steel helmet, whereas my is wearing the slouch hat, which is more commonly represented as a junk for the jungle troops. We're also wearing a standard 37 pattern webbing, we've been carrying all the ammunition, although this is in lightweight order, because in the jungle they carry as little as possible because it's very hard to equipment. Do you want to talk through some of the weapons as they're in front of you, what we? Uh, the weapons we've got on the table is, start with the basics, is a SMLE 303 Lee Enfield. Um, that particular one's, not that particular one's dated 1917. Um, we've got uh, the Bren 303 light machine gun takes the same ammunition as the rifle. Why is it important you to remember, remember that era of the Second World War? Basically to make sure people don't forget, because they've got to be remembered. The, the stuff they went through, a lot of it memories aren't wrote down on paper, unfortunately. And being a part of the 14th Army, the Forgotten Army, we like to keep their memory alive. And you'll find a lot more people kind of tend to open up and a lot more interested when they walk past when they see someone in uniform and um, dressed up. There's a little bit more of a story there to delve into yeah. rather than uh, yeah. than people just you know just normally and, and and as well now we've got the jeeps here and and everything going on with with the guns out and a lot more people are interested in, uh, about the history things like that. But actually see people who are giving up their time to you know dress in period uniform and, and talk to people with so much knowledge about you know the life during the war and what part the battery played and you know, this is one of the best preserved coastal, um, coastal artillery batteries in the country. It's very important for the simple fact that history should be passed down. We don't want it ever to happen again and the only way to make sure that people don't produce what's happened is to educate them on the wrongs of war. I served myself in the British Army. I wear my dad's medals today because it's BJ Day. He was captured by the Japanese and helped to escape by the Austra Australians and then went on to serve in Burma to the big, in the big push in 44 to 46. I did 12 years in total. I, I believe that it's very important that we keep this type of 
this type of memorabilia game. And I joined here because it's an amazing heritage and a legacy that we need to keep going. Definitely. And there's a lot of hard work in the background of the battery here, but we have succeeded beyond doubt to create a wonderful living museum and legacy for future generations to come.